This is episode 153 of Dad Awesome, and we've got Ted Lowe joining us today. It's Christmas Eve. I put on my my red hoodie, and uh, if you're on YouTube, you can see that. Many of you listen on your podcast app, but we are on YouTube as well. And uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas Eve. And uh, we have a special episode today because we're talking the dad life, but we're also marriage. Many of you are married or will be married in the future. And uh, I just, I feel like the theme of marriage is a great theme to hit on Christmas Eve. As we head into, again, Christmas, New Year's, man, let's be dads who are pursuing the heart of our wife. And let's be dads who are just implementing, not that these tools and tactics change everything. Often it's a it's a long journey to change and to bring health and flourishing to a marriage, but uh, Ted Lowe, man, he's going to drop so much wisdom in so many practical ways that we can actually add intentionality, uh, pursue the heart of our wife. So Ted Lowe, he's in Georgia. He runs married people. They work with uh, Orange and the Rethink Group and North Point Church and uh, amazing kind of family of ministry. So Ted spent some time with me this episode talking again, dad life, talking journey, his journey as a kid with a uh, with a single dad losing his mom and uh, growing up again, learning from his dad, but also choosing a different path than his dad in some ways. So, so this is episode 153 with Ted Lowe. It's about going after more moments of awesome and fewer moments of awful. And just, I mean, the fact that this podcast is called Dad Awesome means, of course, some of my friends make fun, poke fun at me. And they're like, oh, really, you're trying to move dads from being dad awful to dad average to dad awesome. It's all about that. So it's funny that we use the same framework, but there is something about creating moments of awesome intentionally versus Mm -hmm. stumbling our way into that. Talk about that principle of of moments of awesome, uh, more of those and fewer moments of awful. Yeah, for sure. I think when we first got married, despite the fact that we were in ministry, despite the fact that we were around people that were uh, great at marriage and even marriage experts, I kind of thought marriage, it is what it is. It just is what it is. And our story is kind of like probably a lot of your listeners in that it's not super dramatic, Mm -hmm. uh, but we would have moments that were so awesome, but then we would have moments that were awful. And so I think a lot of people resonate with that to say, hey, we have both those kind of moments. And sometimes we have seasons of awful or season of awesome, but they seem to be intertwined. And more important, they seem to be uh, accidental yeah. or that they're happening to us. And I think we can choose to have moments of, of awesome with our, with our wives um, and in a way where it doesn't take a whole lot. I call them micro moves. You know, that marriages are made up of micro moves and the sum total of those micro moves equal the condition of our marriage. And so for a lot of people, I get really passionate about saying, hey, this is not a, you don't have to do anything huge. Put a post-it note on the washing machine that says, thanks for doing the millionth load of laundry. If you, if you do the laundry, then find something else that she does. Say, thank you for dealing with the kids in the middle of this crazy crisis. I know they're driving you crazy, but I'm watching, you're crushing it. Uh, or Take lipstick, her lipstick, and write it on the mirror. You are beautiful. One caveat there, don't use the good lipstick because um, th- that actually killed that trick. Actually. No, but it's, it's, those, it's those little moments. It's, again, back to the talking well about them. It's that moment of them hearing you say something about them or encourage them. Um, yep. So, yeah, I think it's we can choose to, to have awesome moments, and they're not big as we think. Yeah. Yeah. Before we jump into your fatherhood journey and what you're learning and how you're growing, let's talk about your dad. As you grew up, uh, what areas did your dad, he got it right? He got it right in the area of fatherhood and you've tried to maybe emulate or repeat that. Yeah, for sure. So um, my mom passed away when I was 10. And so my dad, who fifth generation farmer, man's man, um, you know, went from being the man that, that worked most of the time and our mom took care of us to now the man having to work a lot and in many ways be the, be the mom too. Um, but when I looked about the thing with my dad, the part he crushed it at was being gentle. Like my dad doesn't have a lot of words um, at all. Like my dad doesn't know how to look at me and go, son, I'm so proud of you. That will never come out of his mouth. But my dad never said the hurtful things either. And so he just gentle, strong, uh, steady, uh, and just, he's a shy guy. But the beautiful thing about being shy and not having a lot of words is you don't use them to hurt your kids. Yeah. Right. Mm. 
how how did I mean losing your mom when you're 10? Talk a little bit more about well, one what you uh, what you admired about her because you know you're old enough to really know her, and then and then secondly, like how did that impact you as a as a 10 year old? She died when uh, she was 32, uh, and we lived in this little town, uh, tiny town, but she really had an influence. I mean, she was so compassionate with people. My dad said I would remember my dad talking speaking well of uh, of your spouse. My dad would say your mom would give away everything we have if I would let her. Uh, She would always tell my school teachers before, uh, you know, the first school year, hey, if there's anybody that needs anything, if there's any kid that doesn't have anything, you let me know and I'll get it for them. Which is really funny because I didn't grow up wealthy at all. Uh, I remember saying to her, why don't you ever buy yourself anything? Because she was always giving away. And she says, oh, because it's so much more fun to give it away. And so, uh, yeah, she was an extraordinary person. person in a you know little ordinary town if that makes sense yeah yeah wow um the the idea of loss it really mm-hmm. does change us so you know loss of your mom affected you i'm for sure and your even fatherhood and in, in, in your family life now uh the loss though as a as a dad i just know sometimes valley moments really do impact the values that we bring to our families and and have changed for me valley moments have really impacted the dad that i am today can you think of a story of a valley moment a hard a loss painful time that has impacted the way that you and nancy you raise your kids yeah for sure like my mom you know you know, this is not true for all situations, but you know, stereotypically when I was growing up, your mom knew all the details of your life. Your mom knew when baseball signups were, your mom knew when you needed to take a coat, your mom knew that you had a test going, coming up and uh, she kept up with everything. And then she was out of the picture and my dad didn't know how to do those things. Uh, did, his, heart, his heart was broken. Uh, his heart was, all our hearts were broken. And so there was this there was this gap of somebody knowing, uh, I, I just felt like I would show up places and not have what I needed. And I already felt like the weird kid whose mom had died. And so it was just like amplified it. So one of the things I've said to my wife so many times, I said, one of the greatest gifts that you give our kids is that you know what's going on with them. And so that was important to me. And I think because it's so important to me that I'm able to see it into her. So I think that has, you know, talking about one of those Valley moments, it is, it brings this huge level of appreciation that my kids never go anywhere without mom knowing what's going on. Now she's taught them to be very responsible sure. at the same time. And it makes her ask really great questions. It makes both of, both of us ask questions. You know, you and I are both in youth, youth ministry forever. Uh, and we'll say, we need to pull out our youth pastor skills. Yeah, you know? sure. Uh, but I think that was one of the things. That was a really tough moment, but it not moment. Hmm. You know, when my mom died. I mean, like, I don't know if you ever get over that completely, but right. uh, it was definitely brings out how much I appreciate in her. Yeah, yeah. It's, I my dad went to heaven about ten months ago, and it, you have a new path, right? There's sure. a new path with loss. Thank you. Um, but that path can be can be beautiful. Like there can be really good from. Um, so I, I give credit back to my dad all the time in areas I'm like, well, he's not here now, but man, I can think about him in this moment, and I can honor him and celebrate the dad who he was. And um, I want to go just even a step further in the direction of pain, but in this in this sense, uh, mistakes. So um, because we're called dad awesome, I'd love to hear about a dad awful moment. A moment where you're like, dad fail. I missed it here. I brought pain to my family or I just, you know, I didn't know what, I didn't know any better at that point. Um, Can you think of one of those types of stories of just, man, I missed it. I I can't, I can't. (laughs) I, uh, you said that awesome. And I'm, I'm, listen, listen, you're going to have to give me a category, my friend, because Mm. I've got lots of those. Uh, Tell me what you're fishing for there because yeah, oh, we've always said that we feel like our kids are going to be great at apologizing because we've had to do it so much. That's it. I yeah, mean, I mean that, that emphasis alone, it matters for the dads to hear, like, apologize when you get it wrong, which is often. Yeah, and that's not false humility. That is the truth. Like, we have had to go, wow, you know, as much as my dad didn't talk, I was more like my mom inside the family where we do talk. And when you talk a lot, what my most regretted, uh, the moments I regret the most were from words with my kids that I should not have said. Um, and again, I've apologized for them, but I'm thinking my list for my dad is almost non-existent in terms of words that hurt me. 
And I, that's one of my biggest regrets. Yeah. So that was dead, dad fail is when I allow my emotions to speak for me instead of uh, my head to speak for me. I'm enjoying a lot of stuff right now with neuroscience, like really understanding that when we get triggered, you know, we're speaking out of the amygdala and our logical brain, which is the cortex kind of shuts out. And so you're attacking and you're not giving your, your thinking part of your brain time to kick back in. And so that would be another thing I would, I would say to myself or go back and just say, take a pause. man. It's, you know, it's James 119 and 20. It's, you know, my dear brothers and sisters be slow to speak slow to become angry, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, right? It's just stop, like, my little quick thing is there, like, you know, be quick to listen. In other words, don't talk. <laughs> when you get triggered by them, just give yourself a space. You can always go back and say things, but it's way harder to go in reverse and take those things back. I'd love for you to coach us even a little bit more on this because right away I thought last night, uh, bath time, my, my, my daughter, I found myself yelling at her to stop yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait, yeah. what is that? But that is, I mean, to go back to the brain and the, the, the fact that it's a quick response. So I'm going to use that part of my brain. Coach us a little bit more on maybe ways to even remember to take that pause. Yeah, well, it is, you know, what they found in neuroscience is you need eight seconds for once you're triggered to, for your uh, frontal cortex to click back in. You need those eight seconds. So we've got to figure out how to put the, um, put those seconds in. And the biggest thing I'll say, just don't talk. You know, it's, it's the first thing and all these things, you know, James is saying it happens in order to be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. And when I think about that word of becoming angry, that's the scary part. I've become somebody I don't want to become. I've become a dad that I don't want to become become. So I just think there's this real simple thing of just going, don't talk. And when they're little like that, it's one thing, the older they get, the more important that gets. But I understand the angry, uh, the angry part. But I just think it's this thing of, you know, we only talk about things with our kids and our wives when we're in the middle of those things. Yep. I only talk about you not screaming at me when you're in the middle of screaming at me. Yep. I only talk about you not hitting your sister when you just hit your sister instead of those taking those times when everybody's calmed down, their amygdala's not triggered. And you go, man, when I saw you, uh, you know, hit your sister, that breaks my heart. You know, you guys are going to be together long after we're gone. You got to protect, you know, you got to protect that relationship. And so I think it's those teach, have those moments later. Cause we want to parent like as dads too, we want to coach them up. Yep. You know, you don't, you know, we want to be baseball coaches and <laughs> you know, that works at baseball, but it doesn't work at home. Speaking of coaching them up, though, I think we do have, we have a desired future for our kids. And we, I think, sometimes give ourselves way too much credit. We're like, hey, I can take my child from this point to that point, like a coach would take an athlete forward, where we don't know the place that God has designed and created our kids to flourish, which, which exact direction. There's some obvious ones. Don't run into the street. That's a bad direction. Right. Um, but, but when it comes to like, man, gifts and passions and interests, uh, talk a little bit about the nurture versus nature. Like, like, is it, is it, uh, what, what role does the dad play to get them into the desired future versus watch it unfold? No, that's good. You know, when, you know, my oldest one, I think when he was, you know, coming into the world, all the parenting books, I mean, there was so much pressure on dads and moms about parenting, about you better not mess it up or you're going to mess them up. Sure. And we're all going counselor, counseling and the counselors always, well, how did your dad mess you up? How did your mom mess you up? And so they're digging into that. And so you feel this pressure that if a kid becomes anything or they don't become anything, it's because of you. It's my fault. Yep. It's, it's my fault. Look what I've done. And I think there's always this image for me. It's like, I used to think that when we become parents, that God's given us this big lump of clay. And he says, just mold them, just, you know, mold them and remember me as you're doing it. And I think, you know, they come into the world as our friend in the foster care space, fully baked. They come into this, into the world that God's created them in such, in such a way that they are. And, and then it becomes up to us to steward that. And one of the, the biggest example that we have in our family of this, and this was an aha moment for me, is I was driving my daughter to preschool and it was a 25 minute drive. And I'd look back there at her and I think, you, 
looks just like somebody. And, um, and I'm thinking, is it your brothers? And you're just a girl, so I can't do the math because the brothers don't really look alike. Is it one of the brothers you look like? Is it your mom? And then I would always come up with no. And it surely wasn't me because, you know, I'm ethnically ambiguous. I could be anything. And she's sitting back there, blonde, uh, fair skin, blue eyes. And we pull up to a traffic light and she sees some men um, doing some lawn care work. And she says, oh, daddy, would you look at those guys? They look so hot and they look so tired. And it was like, my mom, you are my mom. My mom said that kind of stuff all the time. Everybody, we're from Alabama, so everybody was pitiful. Oh, they look so, not, not in a negative way, sure. but like, oh, like a compassionate way. Mm -hmm. And it hit me go, that's my mom. And then it all started to come back. And I said to my dad, I said, do you think Teddy, uh, so who's my daughter? I said, you think she looks like, um, you know, mom? And he goes, oh, buddy, you're just now catching up to that? <laughs> of course she does. And so I think it was one of those moments where it was like, God, for whatever reason, molded her like that, mm -hmm. made her like that. Um, and she is tender and she is kind and she is sweet. And so she's a great part of my mom, but my mom is also very anxious mm -hmm. and she worried a lot about us. So Teddy has that as well. We're dealing, you know, in the middle of pandemic, we're dealing with panic attacks. And so you've got both of those sides of her. And so I think all that to say, when we look at our kids, you can take the pressure off yourself, dads, of yeah. thinking that you're in more control than you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and the great thing with that, you know, they do something goofy and go, hey, God made them that way. I had nothing to do with that choice. <laughs> you know, you could play it off that, but it, it does give you some freedom to say, I just got to guide who they are. And they're so different. All oh, my yeah. kids are so different. And I find that for most dads, they'll say, my kids are so different. Do you see that with your girls? Oh man, for sure. And I, I to to build on this even a step further, I heard Levi Lusco, pastor, uh, say that it's it's like archaeology. Like you're you're using a fine brush at times, you're chiseling a little bit, but it's already in there. God's designed a beautiful. I think of my girls, these beautiful, like a beautiful statue, you know, a relic that you never want to damage. So you never want to try to force it to become something else than what it is. But it still takes intentional um, unveiling, unearthing versus versus the oh well, God's got it, so it's it's all, it's all uh, nature. So I just back away and let it happen. So I, I think you're to your point, take the pressure off, but also put the pressure on that we it is our job to unearth that beauty in that direction. So it kind of is both sides and we, we need the Holy Spirit. It's huge. 100%. 100%. I think um, what it does for me, it helps me to focus my role and to focus on the things I am in control of. Yeah. And make an introvert into an extrovert, mm -hmm. I'm not in control of that. Affirming that it's okay for my introvert, that he's an introvert, that's my role. Yeah. That God's made you like that, great. You know, so I think what it's done is allowed me to do that and still feel like, you know, he's an introvert, I need to make him extroverted or that's somehow yeah. gonna be a problem for him, right? Yeah, that, that's really helpful. Uh, we've talked about seeing things in our spouse and seeing things in our kids and seeing things even in, back to your mom and your dad. Like it is part of our role to see a desire, or see attributes, speak life, let's pull those out, speak affirming. But also I think we can see things in like mentors or coaches that we admire and really take note of. And I know that we have a mutual mentor, uh, Doug Fields, Doug and Kathy, that uh -huh. has spoken into your life. You dedicated your book to, to them as a couple. But would you talk mm -hmm. about the value of of a mentor that you can see a desired future and how you get close to them and actually take um, take them up on. Uh, most mentors are willing to give, but um, often we don't actually step in with intentionality and eyes to see those those traits. Oh, I get chill bumps when you even asking that question uh, because of the role that Doug and Kathy Fields have played in their life. They had, you know, they are. I think their kids are ten years ahead of us. So we call them a down the road couple. And I think everybody needs a down the road couple um, and to ask them questions. And uh, I love Doug, but Kathy, <laughs> holy cow, that she has saved us so uh, much grief. With our introverted son, we were at their house and it was always great. We'd vacation with them. And so they would not were around our kids all the time so they could see things that we couldn't. Yep. And so our middle son introverted and he got, he was like, I think it was four three or four at the time. And he would talk in this weird voice and we're like, 
what is he doing? And everybody he talked to were like, this can't developmentally be okay. And so we said to Kathy, we were like, what is this thing? How do we get rid of this voice? And she says, well, and we always give her permission. And she knew she had permission. So she's so great. If you didn't ask, she wouldn't say it. She hmm. said, I don't think I would. Don't worry about the voice. She goes, the voice will go away. She said, I think more of the issue is he is not age appropriate. He is not age appropriate in the way he responds walking into um, a room talking to an adult. She said, you just say to him, hey, buddy, it's, it's okay uh, to be shy, but it's not okay to be rude. So here we are focusing on this Muppet voice we had going on over here. And she had something way more key to say, I'm affirming you, but it's not okay to be rude. It's okay to feel this way, but it's not okay to be rude. And so we've had so many moments with the fields like that. Um, one of the greatest things she would always do is we would call her freaking out about something. And Doug too, he was great as well. But we would call them freaking out about something. And Kathy would always ask this question, is this repeated behavior? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, especially the bigger it was, the bigger the freak out. Is this repeated behavior? Well, 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 no. Well, then they don't know that it's a behavior that they shouldn't repeat. So you tell them, uh, you talk to them. And if this happens again, this is going to happen. Again, it's talking about something, but not just in the middle of something. And Kathy was always so great about that. So I'd encourage anybody, like, who are those parenting heroes that... Um, that you can lean into. What Nancy and I have, but I will say this, I wanna caution people. We usually pick people whose kids are crushing it and they're crushing it. The, the hard thing that we've struggled with the fields is not comparing our family to theirs. Mm. I mean, all their kids are married, young married with kids. They all live really close. They have family dinners on Sunday night. You know, we've known them forever. Uh, and then it just goes great. I mean, they're they're great. And so what we had to be careful is not comparing our family to theirs because we have a very different dynamic in our family. So I would just caution that. Find those people, but know that God's created your family uniquely. And you you said Kathy waited till you gave her permission, till you asked for the speak in. What do you see? How would you how would you coach us in inviting even the, it could be down the road um, friends, but also friends in the same season? How would you coach the inviting feedback? Yeah, I think I think we have to ask for that. I think a lot of times we will sit around and we'll talk about things, and we're sharing things, and we think by talking about them that we've given permission. But a lot of people won't say anything because one, they may not value their opinion that much uh, or we haven't given them. Then they're sitting there going, if I say something, are they just gonna think I'm opinionated? But when we give them permission, hey, will you speak into this? Yeah. I mean, Nancy and I both have friends uh, in our lives and we have to be emotionally shored up before we ask them questions because they're gonna let us have it, yeah. you know? You know what I mean? But I think it's fun and just asking for permission. Yeah. And then reinforcing values. I know uh, you have your family values and then you try to find other like community friendships, people that would reinforce your kids that this is actually a value, not just mom and dad's crazy. What, what, how, how has that played out for, for you guys and your, and your kids? Oh my gosh. I was a youth pastor for a long time, but I, we have a youth pastor in our life named Nathan and Nathan, I cannot tell you how much he meant to my oldest son. My eldest son, we're a lot alike. My oldest son is a leader. My eldest son has looked at me since he's four years old going, I got it. Like, I got this. Um, and we had Nathan in his life who could would say the same things that we did and he would listen, right? Uh, one of the things, you know, I work for a company called Orange and we're always talking about dialing in other people with your same values because there will become a day where you're just uh, like the rest of us, we're like, oh, what do they know? Definitely. But if Nathan says it, uh -huh. so I would ask people, they're quick, who's the Nathan that they're going to listen to? I mean, we had a, another small group leader and he would call and say, hey, I'm, I'm planning on saying this to your son about sexual boundaries. Is this okay? And I'm like, this is fantastic. Yeah. And these are even super way more conservative than I was going to do. So yeah, tell him that. Uh, <laughs> So I think it's finding those people, uh, you know, we're supposed to raise kids in community. I mean, our, our culture has become so uh, focused on being uh, individuals and we all travel and move away from our families. You know, was, there's Dr. Sue Johnson says, you know, we're trying to get emotionally from a 
couple of people what we used to get from a whole village. Wow. And so, you know, and we've, we adopted a, a nine-year-old who's about to become 11. And the counselor with us was like, God never designed you guys to do this all by yourself, mm-hmm. ever. Who's your community? Who's going to help you to do that? And so our independence, I think, keeps us from asking. So yeah. we, got, we got to ask, right? Yeah, your family, it's fun because I, you know, read some of your work and listened and, and all of a sudden I was like, wait, do you have three kids or four? Because your family got more beautiful <laughs> by adding, you know, two years ago by through adoption. Talk about the process for uh, you and your wife around prayerfully deciding to grow your family through adoption. Well, we didn't pray about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, we'd seen too many great movies that had really easy bows around things. And, uh, no, we, uh, we've, we always had thought adoption was part of our story and I'll spare the listeners a long, long journey, but it was, uh, a, a relative, a non-blood, very distant relative, older man who ended up with his grandchildren, weren't really his grandchildren even, but he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. If I pass away, they're going to go into the system. And then Nancy and I said, Hey, we want to be part of that if anything happens and it happened pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, and so, yeah. So talking about fully baked, I mean, she came into this world away and uh, she's a sweetheart. And we picked her up at school the other day and the counselor comes out and she goes, you guys, uh, you have just done such a great job with her. And my wife looks at her dead serious. She goes, Oh no, no, she came to us that way. <laughs> No credit. And, no credit. Great. I mean, yeah, we're we're taking good we're taking care of her, but she came like this, right? Yeah. And to a degree, it's true. But uh, yeah. but yeah, it was that's been a different thing. I will say this, uh, and one person compared it this way. Uh, I think this was seminary. This may be one of the two things I remember from seminary, but like a family is like a baby mobile, and it doesn't matter if it's healthy or not, it starts getting into this rhythm. Mm-hmm. And it, when you add something to the mobile whether it's good or bad, it gets the mobile off, Yep. right? And so we had to adjust to that. So for instance, our kids, our older kids, we had matured with them in terms of our family, in terms of what we can talk about, what we can hang out, what we can do. And then all of a sudden we've got a little kid that's listening all the time, mm. right? And we were very upfront with our kids about sex and we were very upfront about their bodies and all these different things. And so the great news of that is we've grown up and they can talk about what they want to. And so that dynamic has been tough. In fact, we were just together today, just um, just the five of us uh, when Nikki was not there. And so the counselor did tell us it was okay for us to have some time, just mm. the five of us. But it is, it, it, but I think it's good for our family. I mean, I'm watching my middle son stand in the gap and he's not a stand in the gap kind of kid. I mean, but he, you think he's not listening, but he's there. And so when we're kind of out of gas relationally, he steps in. And, and his fun, grouchy, big brother way that yeah. she loves. So, but that's been fun. I think that's been good for our family, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I want to pivot and talk marriage because we just know that the dad life is directly impacted by, man, how how is Michelle and I, how is our marriage? It, we, it brings life or it takes away life in our prayers that we would be bringing life to our kids. Uh, when you coach young couples, and I, I know you got these four core habits, which I just am so grateful for how simple. It's like, I can, I can get my arms around this and actually take steps forward. Uh, would you give a brief overview of the four habits and then we'll go deep into one of them? Yeah, it was very sure. It was very funny when the, uh, I, I, I didn't think the world needed another marriage book. And then I wrote another marriage book, but uh, I wrote it for people who hate marriage books because the publisher brought it to me and it was a uh, hundred pages and it was so thin. And I was like, is this all I know after, you know, 10, 15 years of doing this or 20, 20 years of being married. Uh, and we have a lot of millennials in our office and they're like, no, no, you don't need to make it any thicker. Don't make it any thicker. Yep, yep. Uh, so it's a short read. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot of direction in the Bible about marriage. People talk about, oh, you need to have a biblical marriage. Well, if you're look, don't have a biblical marriage if you're looking for examples in the, you know, in the Bible, because they're frightening. Uh, biblical marriage, I think what they mean is a principle of how God wants us to love each other. So there's not a lot of verses on marriage. And it may be the only time in the Bible where the author just punts marriage. <laughs> it's a yes. um, so I thought, well, what if we took a few of those verses and said, what if you practice these habits? Yep. What if you practice these micro moves? So our first one is have serious fun. 
Uh, we say the best way to protect your marriage is to enjoy it. Yep. And this actually comes from Proverbs 5 when Solomon's warning his son against adultery. And mm -hmm. for like 15 verses, he's like, look out. You better look out. Her feet will lead you straight to the grave. You're going to get to the end of your life and go, why didn't I listen? And I'm like, ah! And then he stops and he goes, the do was be captivated, be intoxicated mm -hmm. by the wife of your youth. May her breast satisfy you always. For people that don't read the Bible that much and they just heard that, yes, that's in the Bible. Uh, and so it was like the best way to protect your marriage is to enjoy it. So we talk about that a lot. You know, um, I feel like it's a huge value that we think, you know, that fun is extra and it's not essential. Yeah. I believe 100% that it's essential. Or, and just to interrupt you on this, like I had oh. thought about, I thought about God's prayer over Jesus at his baptism, Mark 1 11, about, you know, you are my son whom I love and in you, I am well pleased And that. That's what we want to do as dads is really enjoy our kids say, I'm pleased because you're mine. But I thought of that principle with, with have serious fun of like, no, if we're enjoying our wife, if we're saying I enjoy I'd like great pleasure because you're mine. Like, so that, that came up to on that point. I was like, I love that framework. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, now that ours are older, you know, and everybody tells you it's a blink, but if, if, you know, if you don't believe it's a blink, that's okay. I, maybe you used to tell me that I hated it. I hated that. Uh, Cause it just put on this pressure, you know, butterfly kisses, you know, all those songs. Like, ah, it's like, I would, it's like, they're saying to us, you you could make this go slower. You're just not. I hate it when people say it goes by a blink, but I just think from a math perspective, you start realizing how much more time you have with your spouse than you do yep. uh, with your kids. So it's something to think about there. So, but uh, having serious fun is important. The other is love God first. And the real thing on that for me is you, there's a lot of marriage devotionals. There's a lot of things about praying together and that's great. But if somebody said to me, people could do individual counseling or couple counseling, which would I choose that's best for their marriage? It's a no brainer for me. Yep. It's individual counseling. Yep. It's taking care of yourself. Yep. People are trying to get their spouse to meet all these needs that only God can meet or a village can meet. It's too much pressure. People say you complete me. Well, who wants to do that? Like that, God's never designed us to do that. Tom Cruise can't even do that. Um, so I would say love God first in your relationship with him. Uh, people always say, why don't you put that first? And I always go, because humor and fun opens the heart to the deeper things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then respect and love, we unpack what you're really fighting about. Mm -hmm. That is probably the most powerful chapter in terms of practicality of going, oh, this is what we're doing. Because silly fights cause serious damage. Mm -hmm. And this unpacks what's really happening. And so too long to go into, but that's yeah, been a well, powerful thing. Just briefly on that one, though, the idea yeah. that I'm bringing my own brokenness all of this trail of brokenness and baggage and that that it's not about her it's about me and this brokenness coming out so i yeah that that point i know we can't go into deep but um it's a real it's so real it, it is so real and it feels it takes a lot of pressure off of them my counselor said to me one time he goes you think nancy has what it takes to fix you but you don't even know what it is so you're thinking she has something that she doesn't have and you don't know what it is how impossible is that so i think it's you know take care of yourself love god first it is um respect and love what are we really fighting about and the last one is practice your promise we promised our spouse and their families and our friends and that we were going to take really good care of their heart and we you know we, I don't know who wrote wedding vows. I'm not, but I'll tell you what they did it, when it's not in the Bible, but it will say this, it covers it everything. Richer for poor, sickness and health. So death do its part in um, for better, for worse. You know, and you're like, well, that just took care of all my excuses right there. But it's those, you know, practice what you promise. We say this, marriage is not about the big day. It's about the every day. The average wedding in the United States costs $32,000. I couldn't find, I broke the internet. Jeff, I actually broke the internet. Right. I Googled and you say, how much do people spend on their marriage? There's nothing that comes up other than wedding stats. When was the last time you Googled something and nothing came up? It's, I mean, we could have a creative meeting, try to discover what that is, but it is this thing of going, let's, let's talk about the everyday. Mm -hmm. And it's those moments. It's just, it's just those little moments. People right now, especially they need relational wins. And right now, a lot of them, not. and every time there's a conflict, everything, there's a roll of the eye, every time there's a frustration, everything, there's something said in frustration, there's a loss, but the wins are easy. Yep. The wins are easier than we think.
The, the wins are not being on your phone when your spouse is talking to you. A win is coming in the house, not on your phone, you know, or it is, you know, when you're frustrated, taking a break. You know, it always takes two to keep a negative cycle going, but sometimes one can stop it. You know, what's that argument you're never going to agree on? People go, we need to reconcile our differences. There are some things that you're not going to reconcile until Jesus takes you home. There are things that your spouse, you're not going to agree on. If we reconcile the differences, one of us is irrelevant, right? Uh, I don't want to be married to me. I'm an ugly, grouchy old man. I want to be married to a hot woman, right? And so I don't want to turn her into a grouchy old man like myself, but... Um, yeah, but we've just had fun with it. I think it's, you know, it's just the daily moves. I always like to take the pressure off, especially men, because they're always going, just tell me what to do. And I love the heart of men. Men are like, just, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yep. Uh, and always, I've, I always say people don't have bad hearts. They have bad habits. Yep. You know, habits we can change. Right. Most guys won't have it. And it is, we can change. There's little things. I mean, I used to, every time my wife would tell me something, I'd try to fix what her problem. I mean, why else would you share a problem that you didn't want me to fix? I mean, you're probably fixing problems all day long in this podcast, right? That's what we do. That's our jam. Uh, and she said, I don't need you to fill, fix this. I need you to fill this. Oh, that's good. And that thing stopped a gazillion arguments. So, and you, don't you little, ask your wife, hey, is this something you want me to fix or just feel? Do you ask her that? I, oh, I, and let me tell you, brother, 90% of the time, I don't even have to ask anymore. She tells you. Oh, she'll go away with their girlfriends. We talked about this and this and this and this. And I go, what'd they say? Nothing. For the most part, like until she asked. But right now she just, and I'll start fixing it. I go, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm trying to fix it. I should just listen. I'm sorry. I feel it. And then sometimes she will say, no, no, I need a solution. But not most of the time. <laughs> well, I, I'm thankful. My wife does the show notes for this podcast. So you've just dropped like seven to nine, like very practical, just in that last little three minute answer. It's so many practical, but just to reframe to go after a little more practical as we kind of land the plane. Um, if you were landing a plane, you had two minutes of the guy next to you back when we can fly again, right? And the dad next to you is like, give me some practical, like mm -hmm. give me some practical ways I can bring more life to my marriage. I can have more moments of awesome instead of moments of awful. Give us just a few more practical things you'd share with that dad. In terms of parenting? Or um, actually, no, let's go with the first round in terms of marriage to have a, to have a strong marriage. Like give us a few more practical marriage tips. My wife said to me, she says, don't talk to me in your work voice. Mm -hmm. And another friend, wife said, don't talk to me till, like I'm a man. Talk to me like I'm a woman. One of the few verses for men that's very specific is men do not be harsh with your wife. We, we can be so gruff with her and to win her heart, we were so gentle with her. So I think being gentle with her, being patient with her, uh, celebrating who she is. And again, I think it's those moves. Like if you're, I think we've made marriage way too complicated. If you coming home late from work frustrates her, don't come home late from work. Stop it. Yes. <laughs> if you laying clothes on the floor drives her crazy, pick your clothes off the floor. If her laying clothes on the floor drives you crazy, don't care. You know, if her running late drives you crazy, stop caring. And so people, oh, that's impossible. No, it's a choice. And so people are like, really, is that easy? Yeah, it's those, it's those moments, but also making moments that you enjoy. It's not just fixing the broken stuff. It's enjoying the stuff that's already right. You know, it's going back. What makes her laugh? What would, what would make her so happy today? One of my friends, a uh, mentor, he asked his wife on the weekends, what would this weekend, what would it take to make it a 10 for you? Or how can I love you better tomorrow? I mean, it's such simple stuff. And when I ask my wife, like she's acts of service of the five love languages. And I'll say, what around the house would you like for me to do? It is usually not what I thought it was. And here's the great news. It's usually smaller than I thought it was. So I'm winning. But when I guess, I'm, sometimes I'm doing things, I'm trying to make a bid for connection and I'm missing. And I think what most dads are doing, we're making bids a connection towards her. It's not what, how she wants to connect. And then we get frustrated with her. Yep, we're missing. Yeah, we're, we're missing. And it's not a bad heart again, but it's, it's asking or getting clear going, how can I love you more? Uh, and when you would get the answer, the only correct response, thanks for letting me know. 
make sure your face is saying the same thing, right? <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. And it's going to hurt your feeling. And as guys, you're going to feel like, oh, I'm a bad, I did bad. Um, but I just always say to guys, especially to go, you got this. You're better at marriage than you think. People like me have made marriage way too complicated. That's why I wrote the world's shortest marriage book. Yes. It, we've, it's like any other profession. We learn too much, so we complicate everything for people. We get really, really nuanced. We're diet and exercise, and all of a sudden we're talking about molecular physics with people, and they're like, no, no, I need to stop arguing. Yeah. So I think it's with people is just go, keep trying to, you know, especially for that, keep trying to win our heart, right? Yeah. The difference between men and women is men feel like, you know, we've accomplished getting married, and a woman's asking every day, will he still choose me? Mm. We still pick me and every day. And people say, I, do you, women will say, do you love me? And he'll go, you know that I do. What she can't say is, but I need you to help me to know every day, um, which is exhausting for guys. To yeah. Let's just be honest. That was an exhausting thing I just put on to all your listeners. But I don't want to do that. I think it's just pick one thing. Yeah. And see what happens. Yeah, I mean, you did take the fire hose and you fully went after it. Yeah, I mean, we're going to stop that. You've got editing equipment here, my friend. No, no, we just put them in the show notes so people can hit pause, look at the show <laughs> notes. So thankfully, my wife transcribes this stuff. So, but then uh, give us again, I want one more, hook the fire hose up one more time and just go, dad advice. You've got like one minute. What tips, practical tips would you say? Hey, this will make you uh, not perfect. We're not going for perfect, but a more awesome dad if you do some of these things. Yeah, I, I would say this. The, the biggest thing is for you two to get on the same page about what you feel like you're going to do with the kids mm. because they will play you like a fiddle. My oldest one is a very smart boy and he would look at his mom sometimes and he would go, I know you agree with me, but you can't because you have to agree with dad. Now, he would say that and he believed that. Uh, and maybe he was right sometimes. I mean, he, he may have even been right sometimes. But I think it's getting on the same page that we're a collective front. Mm -hmm. That um, I think that if mom and dad are are strong, mom and dad are because kids need to know that you're solid. Mm -hmm. And for people that may you're going, oh no, I'm you know I, I'm remarried. That's okay because right now I'm talking about the marriage you're in forward, and say they need to know that that marriage is solid, yeah. right? Because I've talked to a lot of people that said, hey, my parents were a hot mess. I'm not advocating divorce in any way. I'm just saying if someone has, my parents were a hot mess and then we remarried. But that marriage, I watched dad do it well. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, God's mercies are new every morning. Thank God for all of this. But I think just being on the same page with their mom is so important. Yeah, yeah it's really practical, really, really helpful. Uh, would you take a moment and just pray for all of the dads listening? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, God, forgive me for putting up the fire hose right at the last minute. I knew better, God. I knew better. But it's just like dads. We <laughs> we have successes and failures. And, and God, I love right now that people, uh, these guys have Googled or somehow landed on this podcast and they're listening to this, uh, not because there's not anything else to listen to, but because they want to be good dads. Um, they want to be awesome dads and they're you know maybe they're feeling that's not happening we're all confused right now with everything going on in our world uh so thank you for their heart i pray you would um, bless um, what they hear and we know god that you speak very specifically to us so we've talked about a lot of stuff the great thing with you is you talk to us as individuals and we thank you for that and so i pray that uh, people would not feel heavier as listening to this but they'd feel lighter and feel like Hey, I can pick one thing or God, would you help me know which one to pick and just do that one little thing, just that one tiny little thing to see what happens. If it doesn't work, try the next little thing. If it does keep it going, but God, we, we love you. We thank you that uh, you are the ultimate dad and you love us no matter what. Uh, and we're so thankful for that. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 153 with Ted Lowe. The show notes, the uh, conversation links, the action steps, the quotes are going to be at dadawesome.org slash 153. 
Also, man, it is Christmas, so I just wanna get again wish you guys a Merry Christmas and encourage you to continue as a Christmas gift to this ministry. Uh, you can leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. You can share this on your social stories, or you can simply text another dad, dadawesome.org. And uh, man, we'll receive that as a Christmas gift because we are prayerfully, as we head into the year 2021, we're prayerfully gonna expand the reach, the impact, the ministry of Dad Awesome. And you're a part of that by, uh, by helping to pass this along to other dads. So thanks in advance for your Christmas gift. Uh, let's go after it. Guys, Christmas, New Year's, let's be dads who are chasing the heart of our wife, chasing the hearts of our kids. Let's be prayerful. Let's be intentional. Let's have some fun. Let's add some life to the dad life. 